All right, this is the Big Douglas Show, a Friday game edition. Today, I got Jamal Forbes from the Trap or Die podcast. Jamal, how are you? Hey, I'm I'm good, man. I can't complain. Look, uh, I told I told my boy Dre, who's the the the, the co-host with me, uh, work has been kicking my ass this week. So when I tell you the the football, you know, I, I I'm I'm itching for it in just a week in the general. I'm I'm doing pretty good, man. I cannot complain. And George Carmen, the editor from Full Press Coverage, Washington, and new podcast host himself. Jamal, we might as well get out the game now that George is in it. Nah. How are you? <laughs> What's up, y'all? I'm doing well, man. Happy Friday, y'all. Good to see you. Thank you for having me, Doug. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Look, George was on. Jamal been trying to get on forever and scheduling conflicts just kept it from happening. And Last time George was on, I was still on anchor, uh, just doing audio <laughs> off my phone in the bedroom. So we've come a long way, Doug. Come a long you, way. Yeah, but, but, so I'm glad to have you back on again. So you, man. happy to be here. Uh, let's start with this uh, fan favorite birthday game Friday. We haven't played in a little bit. I've got five celebrities here. I'll read them off and see how close you guys can get to figuring out how old they are this week. Okay, let's start with okay. Halle Berry has a birthday this week. How, how old do you think Halle Berry is? I saw this actually. Go ahead. You go, go first, your boy. You got it. Okay, cool. Because uh, I don't know. And I'm going to take this guess and I'm going to say uh, Halle Berry. Woo! I'm going to say 56. My guess, I think she's 50 straight up. Go ahead. She just turned 50. I think she just turned 50, I thought, because I saw a picture on Instagram. I was like, okay, okay, yeah, she's looking all right. So she's doing good. 50, 50, 55. Oh, there you go, Jamal. Got you. Oh, <laughs> yes, sir. I love it. I love it. I like these games. Let's do another There you one. go. It is nice. <laughs> Not bad. Ben Affleck has a birthday this week. Ooh. How old is Ben Affleck? You got it, George. Go ahead. Um, it's got to be near J-Lo's age, right, because they're dating again. I'm thinking 46. Okay. Um, I'm going to say 51. 49 for Ben Affleck. 49. Uh, Is Ben Affleck the best Batman? Who's the best Batman? Ben. Ben. Um, I, I, so I, I can't remember the guy before him, but I used to watch him in the 90s. I, I want to say Michael it was Keaton. George Clooney. Was it Christian, Bale also, Christian Bale took a turn as Batman as well. Okay. Hmm. Shoot, that's actually a really good question. Because like, Christian Bale made the Dark the Dark Knight Rises. That was uh, that was Bill, wasn't it? That was Bale. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm about to say that that was my memories of Batman. So now that you 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 popped that back into my head, I ain't gonna lie to you. At, at first it was it was Ben Affleck, but then I thought about it. it like though I can't take away the memories of, of the, the Dark Knight and all that stuff. So I'm a I'm gonna switch it mid thought. That's that's my guy. I, I can't take away. I can't take away those 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 movies. The trilogy was amazing. They won. Yes, it was. Let's see. Uh, John Gruden has a birthday this week. How old do you think John Gruden is? Um, Jamal, you go first. You want me to go ahead first, George? Go okay. first, man. All right. I'm gonna say you said Gruden, so I'm I'm thinking. Well, clearly he's older. He's older than than Jay, but I'm going to say like, I'm going to say probably 50, 50, 55, 55. That's a good guess. I'm thinking like 53, kind of where I was at with him. 58. Uh-oh. Where we at? Eight. 58. Damn, Jamal, you beat me all three times. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, bad, Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence has a birthday this week. Jennifer Lawrence. Um, all right, that's on you, George. You got the first step. All right, I think she's younger. I think, I think, uh, I'm guessing mm. early 30s. So let me guess 33 for her, Jennifer Lawrence. That, I don't know if that's too young, too old. Look around. So the thing is, I remember because this is the power pop, Hunger Games, Hunger girl, Games girl. Yeah, uh, right. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I remember at one point I came across her age and she wasn't that far away from me. And I think George, you may have the, the you may have the perfect number. So in order to, I'm not gonna be a hole, but I may have to be a hole with this one and just say 29. Like I just separated by a couple of years, but yeah, I'm gonna just say 20. I'm gonna just say 29. 31, 31. Right down the middle. There you go. All right. And let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let
Malcolm Jamal oh, yeah. Warner has a birthday this week. Malcolm Jamal Warner. Theo has a birthday this week. Mm. He also right, was in something for a one. couple of days. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Jamal Warner. Um, Theo, that's up there. That's up there. Like in terms of uh, when he was there, he was a little bit younger. So I'm gonna say he's in his 40s still. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 47. That's a good guess, Jamal. I was thinking the same thing. He's probably in his teens in the 90s, right? So I'm thinking maybe 40. I'll be 44. How about that? Would have been teens in his 80s. Malcolm 80s. is 51. Wow, okay. All right. Okay. Now, I love it when we play the game and guys really like try to put the math together and do it right. So thank you for playing the game properly. Well, uh, as you can tell, that, that I'm a competitor, so it, it works That's out. right. Oh, hey, I love it. Who's, not, who's not here today, but who loves playing the game and he takes it real serious? Uh, let's see. So we actually have a game on the field today. I was thinking about this. I was talking to my brother earlier this week. It'll be interesting to see what happens. There was no preseason last year. Only three games this year for the first time. We really don't have a sense of how Ron's going to handle this thing. Unless he said it, you guys have heard it, and I haven't, and feel free to say so. I haven't really heard him say what the plan is for this evening. So it'll be curious. And then we don't have any idea for sure what happens next week. There's a two-week layoff between next week's game and the first preseason game. So, Jamal, let's start with you. What, what do you expect? What do you hope for this evening? Um, so I, I kind of feel like so I kind of feel like I expect the the key players to at least get a quarter of work. Um, to, to to your point though, Ron didn't specifically mention for game two how much time he expected them to play. He he just said said in like a more of a a, a broad perspective that he he expect he he's expecting these guys to play. So it wasn't no specific timetable. Uh, but for me, yeah, about a quarter. Um, similar to what we saw last night with the Patriots and the Eagles, uh, more so on the Patriots side, uh, getting the work that they did with their starters. Um, and then in terms of the game, uh, things that I, things that I want to see, because I know we're going to talk about the one thing uh, offensively and defensively, but some things that I wanted to see more in a general perspective again was just making sure that these guys are, are in sync with one another. Uh, one of the things that we noticed last week uh, just in general, there was some there was some good timing uh, between uh, and good trust actually, which is actually pretty good. Good timing and trust between Terry McLaurin and Fitzpatrick, as well as uh, Fitzpatrick and Logan Thomas on their two hookups uh, on on their individual hookups per se. But um, it kind of it kind of points to the fact that the the repetitions and the amount of trust that's been building through practices and, and the, the the many different seven on sevens, eleven on elevens, team drills, things like that is kind of paying off. Um, but th those two specific connections is what I'm speaking on. Like those two is, is, is actually coming down to the chemistry and the things that they work together off, uh, outside of the, the game day actions. But yeah, um, I just want to make sure that they're in sync, man. And, and, and obviously, uh, no, no big mistakes in terms of missed assignments and things like that. That's one thing that you just don't want to have as it continues to move forward into the, to the regular season. Uh, again, last week. Uh, the very first drive we saw on third down and one with Peyton Barber, the people that everybody hates, including me. I, I do. I mean, hate is a strong word. Hate is a strong word. So I take that back. Just say a lot of people dislike him. I, I'll say that because I, I definitely don't hate him, but he's just not that good of a running back to me. But it wasn't his fault on that third and one where he got stopped short. We ended up punting and things like that. That was clearly a missed blocking assignment on the left side of the line. Um, and we don't know who uh, is attributed to that, whether it's the quarterback or the offensive line, just not properly picking up the, the free man on the edge. Um, so, again, to close it out, just – I need to see some in syncness. I need to make sure that there is no missed assignments, things that are on Washington's fault versus the actual other team beating you. The other team beats you, that's one thing. But if you're messing up and you're screwing up, that's something that's not, that's that's an eye raiser for me. So I just need to make sure that they're in sync and they're, they're on, all, hitting on all centers. George, wait, uh, if, let's assume that they play a quarter. And, and Jamal, I think that's reasonable. Uh, do you think they'll play any next week, or would you rather see them sit everybody and just get two weeks of work in afterwards? 
they just give him a rest, right? I think this game is going to be the big dress rehearsal. Like, you know, typically we'd have that third game that we had in previous years with that three out of four preseason games. I think Jamal's on the right track, right? I think um, one thing to consider right now, it's actually pouring right outside the DMV. So it's a really sloppy day today. I think Ron would love it if the players just came out, had a pretty clean couple of series. And if they look good and you know, if it's Patrick's out there and they score a touchdown on the opening drive, that might also dictate how much they're on the field, right? If it's, it's pretty bad conditions, they don't want them out there. Um, I do think, uh, I do want to see execution as Jamal talked about. Um, I don't really want to see much from our defensive line. Like I like, I love, you know, Chase Young and Maka Sweat. Like what, what are they to gain by basically being out there on, in these conditions just without, you know, exposing themselves to potentially being hurt. Like they're going to be ready to go. Um, I do want to see some development. Like I think we'll, we'll talk about it later on, but I'm really interested in Diamond Brown. It's one of my like, most intriguing people that I really want to keep an eye on this year. And I want to see him with the first team offense. Like I, he had two catches for 16 yards last week and, you know, he kind of like popped a little bit, but I want to see him as like, you know, I doubt Curtis Samuel plays today. So I'm guessing, um, you know, I'm guessing, uh, Danny Brown will probably be on the outside wide receiver too. And that'd be kind of cool to see him hit, hit a couple big shots. So if it was up to me, I would have, you know, one clear, clean cut quarter with all the starters, um, you know, take out Antonio Gibson and Young and Montez Sweat early, take out like our prime guys early and then, you know, rest them next week. I mean, there's no, like that should be the final um, vision to basically reflect on who we're going to put on our team, like, like on the back end of the roster, that should be our, like give them time to prove their worth. So that's kind of my perspective. I'm curious that the coaches have conversations about this before the game, right? So like it's, you know, it's, it's pouring up there. So I wonder if the coaches say, Hey, listen, let's, what do you think about a quarter that way? You know, if Ron say wants to do a quarter and the other guy uh, for the Bengals, I can't think of the coach's name off the top of my head right now, but let's say he planned uh, I think on it's sitting Spacey. His, Zach Spacey, I think. Say he planned on sitting his today. You know what I mean? Then what's the point of putting your starters out there if you know he's not going to put his starters out there or vice versa? I was always curious if that was uh, something coaches did. I also wonder if, uh, George, be, to your point, because of the rain, if that doesn't switch up his plan some. You saw uh, that Joe Burrow was – that they don't do much today and do more work next week if it's going to be a nicer day out. That's a good point. You know that uh, Joe Burrow's not going to be out today, right, Doug? You caught that? I did catch that. Yeah, so Joe Burrow's going to be out. So it's going to be Brandon Allen rolling up for the Bengals. So it's, you know, that's going to be another interesting thing. Is it really going to be a true test of the defense? So we'll see how that goes too. But that's a good point. If the weather is nice next week and maybe, you know, one more quarter out there, two weeks off is definitely time to re recoup and recover and to make sure that you are uh, prepared for the season. So that's a good perspective. Well, see, the thing for me, uh, I'm not going to lie to y'all. Like throughout the, it was maybe Monday. What's today? Friday. It was maybe Monday or Tuesday where Rivera, intentionally held a practice in the rain uh despite the fact that they had a tent and a bubble at ashburn and i think that's one of the things that uh we should focus on because what that'll what that'll tell us is i don't think the rain is going to get in the way of any of the plans that they got going on today like regardless if he had an intention on if he had intentions who knows if he actually had intentions prior to but if he had intentions on starting uh sweat uh, Logan Thomas, Antonio Gibson, Fitzpatrick, Terry McClellan for a certain amount of time. I don't think the rain would have would have negated any any of that in terms of how much how much time he wants to see him out there. So uh, the, Rivera has emphasized he like he wants this team to get better. He wants this team to practice in conditions that they'll be playing in the regular season. Like you can't cancel you can't cancel a game because it's raining like a, a regular season game. So um, this is something that while I do think weather plays an impact. For for some people, especially a player, a person like Jay Gruden, who who would have who would have who would have not hesitated to take that team indoors, or would have easily said, you know what, man, we can't risk you cutting on the wet field, so we're we're gonna keep you out this week, uh, this preseason week, rest up, ice up, son. Like you can't, that, that's I don't think that's gonna happen here. I think he's gonna he's gonna intentionally start whoever it is that he wants to start and play him for X amount of time if until he's seen enough. That's kind of my that's my side of it. No, and that, that's fair, and, that, and that's true. He did that also, and and you're right, they do. Uh, it's interesting. I was thinking about this also. You brought up Jay Gruden. One thing that I took away from that first preseason game, there were really no penalties. It, it was a really clean game, yeah. and that that is coaching. And, and it's odd because both coaches are considered players' coaches. 
Uh, I don't think people realize that, but Ron is considered by most to be a player's coach. Two totally different styles of player's coach, because I don't think Deshaun Jackson is giving Ron the old purple miracle. <laughs> Not at all. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Uh, and, and that's, I think, to your point, just to build on it, um, you're 100% right. I think uh, Jay was a person that people can can call their friend. Um, like, if you're, as a, as, a, as a player, you can call Jay your friend. <laughs> He's a cool guy. But when you're talking about Coach Ron, they'll still distinguish the difference. Like, Ron is relatable, but he's still my coach. And and I can't I think those are the the distinct differences between Jay and and Ron is that uh like yes there's an established level of comfortability when you talk to these guys but at the same time you you do understand that there's somebody in charge there's somebody that you respect and that's that's what the players that's what we sense the players are gathering or or how they feel about Ron Rivera versus um that culture and that that Jay Gruden kind of led and established from his get go. Yeah, I, I agree with Jamal as well. I think we're all adults here, right? We're all in the workforce. We all kind of put in our hours and there's just different leadership styles. And I think one of Jay Gruden's strengths was that he was approachable, but his weakness was that he was disorganized. He wasn't very on top of his P's and Q's. While Ron Rivera is basically, you know, organized to a T, runs a professional organization. He has more of like a fatherly approach. And our team is very, very young, actually. I believe we have like almost half our team is 25 and below. And I think um, it's different, right? It's like, hey, they liked Jay Gruden. They thought he was like, you know, approachable and kind of a more of a friend as Jamal kind of alluded to, but they have respect around Rivera. Like we've all been there before. We've had cool managers that we like to talk to, but when you want to get your job done, you want to be effective. You want that person that's highly organized. That's been there before. That's been in the, that's been in the grind. Like Ron Rivera was a football player as well. So he's actually, you know, he's been behind the defensive line. And I think that kind of earned some weight with our young defensive minded coach, you know, our defensive minded team that we have. So um, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Yes, I like that. Well, and to your point, George, that that story is floated around, you know, how Ron has said with Jeremy Reeves, you know, him keeping Reeves around and telling him, keep busting your tail and we'll bring you back and brought him back over a guy like Ed Reed, who is, or not uh, Ed Reed, but um, uh, Eric. Um, Trey Boston, Eric right? Reed, yeah. His, oh, yeah, yeah and let him stay. And that meant to a lot of other players, not just Jeremy Reeves on the team, because Jeremy then goes back and tells the other guys on the team, you know, hey, Ron told me bust my tail and he'll give me first crack at it. And he did give me first crack at it. And that goes a long way in the locker room to, you know, really strengthen the bond. Because I saw your post earlier, George, the team is extremely young. I, I think it's the second or third youngest team in the league right now. Mm hmm and, and they, need some of the, they need some more of that discipline. I, I couldn't imagine. Hey, you're right. You like to drink a beer with Jay Gruden. You like <laughs> Ron to get things done at the job site. Uh, Jamal, when I was on with you guys, I don't know, maybe a month ago, we were still talking about wide receiver six and seven. We're still talking about it now, obviously. But how important really is whoever that six or seven man is? I mean, if we spent a month talking about it because there was nothing else to talk about or is it important? Um, I, I do think it's ultimately important because uh, there's, so there's a couple reasons. First reason being uh, special teams that that's the immediate part uh, that, that number six will play uh, seven if they decide to keep seven, but I don't see that as being likely, but six, even shoot five and six like that's 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 their immediate contribution in special teams like that's the back end of the death chart where these guys are going to make the the biggest impact regardless of how much time they get at the receiver position however um you got to be prepared in case somebody goes down too like or even if somebody needs a uh they need a spell they need a spot and uh that's that's kind of where five and six comes in what role can they play can they play can they play slot can they play the x can they play the y can they play all three positions uh and if not who who is their primary who are they primarily backing up so number five on the depth chart or number six on the depth chart can back up the slot man or can back up the x or can back up the y like these guys they have their roles and that's kind of uh how it fills out at the bottom end so you have the the, the top three obviously terry uh terry diami uh adam and then you go from there cam is obviously up there somewhere but that's on the coaches to determine but you have those three you know what they're going to do uh and then and curtis sam excuse me sorry for getting in but you get it like they have these specific roles that they already have carved out for their team but who's going to back them up 
and that's where five and six comes in and if they decide to keep seven that's where seven comes in so yes ultimately it's important but the primary job for five and six and all the bottom end is special teams but eventually they will play important roles on the offense whether it's like five or six five or six snaps a game on offense they'll have some time George, it's interesting. The first uh, drive of the preseason game last week saw Schweitzer with the first team. It appears that Flowers has taken most of the first team reps this week. Do you see that as Flowers taking the position? Or do you think Ron is just trying to divvy up the reps as evenly as possible between the two to see who works better with the first team unit? I think Ron, he's just a seasoned coach, right? He knows that you can tinker and kind of play with all this whole training camp. But training camp isn't a finite, defined thing. You can definitely move people around. And I'm sure you guys caught it. You guys are heading. You guys know your stuff. Jared Patterson was basically going with the ones and twos this weekend as a running back. And I don't think he's going to challenge Antonio Gibson. But he wants to give each player a true opportunity to kind of show off what they can do and kind of just see how the chemistry works. You're kind of like – he keeps preaching – um, position flex and position utility he basically wants to see how people can do and I just think he's kind of exhausting all options now just in case um, you know you know to figure out what he wants to do if he wants to have a starter in this regard or he, as we know throughout the year injuries do pop up and you do want to basically plug people in um, I think Ron's a forward thinker I think he knows that um, you know going down in the future like um, basically you know he wants to give Eric Flowers reps with the first team just just in case you know you know, Wes, whatever, Schweitzer's not doing too well. He could just jump in and have that chemistry there because he's seen it before and done it before. I think that exposure is helpful over a 17-week season. Um, that being said, I was kind of surprised it took Eric Flowers this long to basically get ahead of him. I thought uh, I thought pretty highly of Flowers. He's kind of a big-bodied guy and did pretty well here. Um, their PFF scores are pretty much the same. I think they're, they're pretty interchangeable, to be honest with you. Like, they both have their flaws. I do kind of like Eric Flowers. Um, He's a pretty solid, if I remember, you guys might know better than me, but I'm pretty sure he's a pretty solid pass blocker, but he can improve in his ferocity as a run blocker, if I remember correctly. So something we need to kind of grow on there, but I could be wrong. But you now, know. I think you're right. I think the difference between the two is I think Eric is the better pass blocker and Schweitzer is the better run blocker. I think okay. to your point that you say there. Okay. Uh, and City Charles, I think, took more the most reps of any offensive lineman in, in preseason game one. It's interesting, uh, Jamal, it feels like you know, maybe Cosme's got blue chip talent and that's what they're hoping for. It feels like the offensive line has a lot of guys you'd like for depth, but not a lot of guys where you look at and say, that guy's a rock star, uh, which may be why we have, other than, of course, Sheriff as well. And maybe that's why this offensive line thing hasn't really filled itself out yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think one thing that we kind of it's, it's funny when we talk about Cosme, because um, when you think about Taylor Heineke, uh, you think about somebody like the, the, the common term when you talk about Heineke is he's a gamer. <laughs> um, that's what everybody says when, when it comes to Heineke. You don't really know what you're going to get in practice, but you know what you'll, you'll see in the game. It's a guy who competes his ass off 110 percent every single every single play. And when you think about Sam Cosby at this point, um, they weren't necessarily glowing reviews coming out of training camp. I'm not saying he played poorly, but there was nothing, there was no consensus. Cosby's been playing really good. Like he's had those couple days here and there, similar to Heineke, where you know it was really good, but nothing consistently good uh coming from Cosby's camp. And you see him in his first game, and he's very impressive. Like it's very impressive to see him play, and then you kind of figure, like, all right on the right side of this line, we may have something going here. Like you mentioned, blue chip uh, is one game, but you the, the point is you want to see more and you want to see how far can he keep going? How consistent can he be? Um, and if it's something where you're so comfortable after three games of the preseason where Ron Rivera is starting him at right tackle, your eyes is telling you what, you, what you're seeing. Your eyes is telling you that, hey man, this guy right here, 
he may actually be that replacement for Morgan Moses. We'll see how it goes. He's going to take his lumps for sure. But that's that's the good thing about Sam Cosme is that he's going to get his lumps in game. And it's, it's nowhere to go but up from wherever level he's starting at. It's nowhere to go but up. Um, so to close, I, I do think that you're right. There's nobody. There's no standouts um, right now. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think if, out, of, out of all the people on the offensive line, uh, Sam Cosme is a, a legitimate storyline that we should be following uh, heading into Cincinnati, but then also heading into the Baltimore game. Well, they, that? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Well, you, you, sure, George, let me just say this. They yeah. obviously liked him because it took one day of walkthroughs before they told Morgan Moses he could uh, you know, <laughs> head out of town. So go ahead, George. Yeah, definitely. And that's a good perspective, Jamal. I like that. I definitely want to keep an eye out for that gamer theory with Sam Cosme. Um, what I like with Ron and what I like with Martin Mayhew and our other like, you know, pseudo GMs that we have is I feel like they pick players with these high upsides. So like Sam Cosby is an athletic freak. I don't know if I'm sure you guys have tracked that. He had an awesome relative athletic score. He's very athletic. And um, he just, his um, profile coming out of college was that he can do anything, but he needs to refine his technique. And to me, that's what a, a team building should do. That's what you should do if you are a roster manager. Like, um, I was on yesterday with my pod, and like Trevor Stores was giving um, Jamin Davis a hard time. Like, oh, I mean, he didn't show anything in the first game. I'm like, dude, be patient. These guys are like sp- special players. They're like, they're speed, care- you know, they, they have the athletic profile, but just like basketball, just like any sport, you're drafting for projection, right? So I do think Sam Cosby came in. Well, I was impressed that he came in during that first preseason game, did a pretty good job. And he was burying people along, like, along the goal line, which is probably the most important like feature you want from an offensive line, he buried the right side so Peyton Barber could run on in. And um, I think he is going to be that long-term potential at right tackle because, you know, I'm sure you guys know, right tackle is predominantly more of like the running, it's more of like the tackle that you, you use for the run game. You typically you go to the right side, the right tackle kind of bumps out and kind of runs down the field. That's more of the strength. So I think Cosby has that athletic profile to project to that and going forward. I guess the one thing is where are we going to go with left tackle in the future? And I don't want to steer your direction, um, Doug, but like, what do you guys think about Sadiq Charles? Do you guys think he's like, like I'm, it's too early, but like he was drafted like, like within hours of us releasing Trent Williams. And they were talking about him being the replacement on left tackle. And now he's struggling for playing time. Do you guys, are there any concerns for you guys? Or how do you feel about that? Doug, go ahead, give it, give it, give it a stab. Well, I think it's interesting with Charles, they, um, I mean, they went out and got flowers, right? I mean, Schweitzer had a good year last year. I mean, he just did. Getting getting flowers to me wasn't necessary. So it, Ron kind of, so far in his tenure here, I keep saying this, like, you just got to look at what Ron does. He tells you by his actions. So to me, if they were super high on Charles or super at tackle or super high um, with Cornelius at tackle, then you probably don't need to go get Leno. Leno, I guess, is maybe just above league average. I mean, if they didn't go out and get a superstar, no disrespect to Leno, just it is that Bears let him go for a reason. Um, but I, I mean, I personally like Sadiq, uh, and he's another one of these athletic freaks that you talk about. So I don't know. He he needs something this year, though, or they'll be uh, moved right by him. So I, I'm curious to see because we really don't know. He, he's played nothing but guards so far, which also should tell you something about how they see him at tackle. One thing before Jamal jumps on in, it's what a little insight that I have. Like half of my family lives in Chicago. They're like Chicago Bear fans. And the way okay. they view and the way they view Charles Leno is the same way we view Morgan Moses. Like, you know, he's a steady presence, he's a good leader. He's good, but like he's nothing special. So that's just kind of something to have in the back of your mind. So I don't know, like I don't know if there's a long-term solution there. But um, Jamal, what are you thinking, man? Um, I, I wish I could remember who gave who who said this, so I can give them the proper credit. But I, I'll just say this wasn't this wasn't my original thought behind this. But um, they're cross training, uh, they're cross training him for a reason. I'm talking about Shadiq Charles. Uh, he's playing. He's playing guard. He's playing tackle, uh, and and I think that the reason behind this has has to do with the fact that they're preparing more so, not necessarily this year. Um, obviously, they want to make sure that he's actually a, a number two 
for whatever whatever happens and, and he can spit he can do a spot fill in a quick second but i think whatever happens next year is where he'll play his most critical role in his third year uh as a as a tackle or a guard for uh, the washington football team um because they, they want to make sure that he's properly trained in both aspects because if somebody drops if brandon sheriff drops um they're gonna, they'll still need a guard and and maybe sadiq can play that role if leno's gone they'll still need a tackle and maybe Charles can play that role. Like, so, excuse me, yeah, Sadiq, excuse me. But yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, I don't think this year is going to be his year. Uh, it's too much talent in front of him, and, and it is what it is. Like, uh, maybe he severely or unexpectedly over overcomes and, and upseats uh, West. But I, I don't see that. I don't see that happening at least this year. So I'm, I'm thinking more so his play is going to be in his third year, not necessarily this year. Well, it's called me crazy here, but the with the way that the new uh, practice squad rules from last year carry over to this year, I was thinking, I wonder if Jarrett Patterson becomes RB3 because you could put Jamal's favorite running back, Barber, on <laughs> the practice squad, and I would assume that he clears waivers there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, if I had Jarrett Patterson in one hand – and Barbara and the other ask you which one clears waivers first. I think Barbara does. I also think the same thing about Samus Reyes versus um, the uh, uh, is they Seal Jones is, uh, or Hemingway? Yes. Hemingway? Which one? Yeah, Seal Jones. Seal Jones, okay. Yeah, Bates, okay. I think Bates is locked in at tight end too. I, th- I think that was obvious. I, like, I think I agree. And I think it should be. Uh, but I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are on on that kind of idea where. Now that you can put vets on the practice squad, I wonder if that's not the way to go. And, and they don't need as much practice time to get ready if you actually need them in a game. Do you mind when I go first? Let me jump on it. Um, I, 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 my bad. My bad. I'll, I'll go first. But uh, I was, I, I was kind of <laughs> stuck for a second because when you're talking about Barber, I would say um, – I think you have a good point, Doug. I, I can't wrap my head around anybody really interested being interested in a in a running back who averages two point seven yards per carry and and really didn't miss a single game last year. Like he wasn't out because of injury. It's either he played or he didn't play, but he wasn't hurt. And two point seven yards per carry, no matter how you slice it, is terrible. I don't Not care who good. like any running back will never they will never they will never go out if somebody said hey man you know I, I don't know you but I, I heard you play the NFL what was your yards per carry last year he's not going to brag about 2.7 yards per carry he's not going to do it he, he's going to say you know I had a couple of carries here and there a couple of touchdowns <laughs> things like that so I say that to say I don't know like what type of value he has for other teams but I see why people like him and I see why he can be an asset for a team but I just don't I have a hard time believing it uh, and so with that being said yes I think he can clear waivers but um, does Washington even want to risk that, given that uh, they 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 clearly see him as valuable? And like that's obviously my opinion aside. I'm not going to sit here and say they're making a mistake or not. This is what they want to do. If that's what they want to do, cool. Um, but that's that's for for Pat. Uh, that's excuse me. That's for the Patterson slash Barber situation. Um, I personally think that that Patterson has a really good shot to actually overtake uh, overtake um, what's his name, but. Uh, I, as far as Samus Reyes, I, I think I don't think he'll clear waivers. Um, but I also think if he misses the third game, my opinion can change because if he only played one game, I don't think there's going to be people out there that's that impressed with him. Uh, but what we saw and what we were paying attention to, we know that he's a really good, he's a physical blocker and, and strong, a strong presence in the run game. So I will say. He has the potential to make this 53, but if he misses the next two games, Washington has a good shot at, at, at bringing him on board for uh, at least, like, stash him. Maybe the pup list or maybe uh, IR or something like that. Like, they have a good chance of stashing him. So uh, it all depends on how these next two weeks unfold for, for Sam's race. All right, let me jump on it. So, yeah, um, let me go – let me start off with Peyton Barber, right? So I don't say I, I love Peyton Barber, right? We're going to be – you know, we all have a love-hate relationship with him. But what I like about what Peyton Barber is he does what he's <laughs> supposed to do, right? He's a utility piece. I think, um, like, with Ron Rivera, like what I like about him as our coach is I don't think he's particularly dynamic as like a play caller. He's not like an Andy Reid or a Sean Payton. But what I like about him is he's like a leader of men and he's a roster builder. I think that's what he does. And I think um, 
what he's trying to do with this team all together on offense and defense are find pieces that fit and basically just play football to win games. This is, that's his intention, right? So I think with Peyton Barber, I think he does like, provide value for our team. Like we know Antonio Gibson is a dynamic running back. He really is. I think he's going to be a breakout candidate in fantasy, but I think with Barber, it's like, all right, like, do we really want Gibson on every single play on the field? Like, you know, I think you do have to have him on third down and kind of prevent, you know, if, if McKissick is constantly on the field as a third down back, it's going to kind of be a tell to the defense what we're going to do. So you do want to have Gibson on the field to basically be, you know, some sort of like mirror, going you know, to smoke a mirror for what you want to play. So I think um, basically you want to give Gibson a blow. So I do like the fact that Peyton Barber can get out there. So that's, that's step one for him. I think um, in regard to like, in regard to like roster flexibility, I think you can be wise with it. Um, going with our offensive line, right now we have 10 people on the roster. I think we have more actually, but we have like 10 serious candidates on the roster basically for our team. And I think what you could easily do, since many of them are kind of flexible and can kind of go play guard and tackle, that's where you can kind of hide a roster spot. Like, are you going to have that seventh wide receiver? Or are you going to try to sneak at that extra running back? So you can have nine offensive linemen, take one of those veterans and try to sneak them onto the practice squad. And with that deficit at offensive line, you could potentially have Barber and Patterson on the team. I don't want to risk Patterson. I kind of like what I'm seeing with him so far. And I want to see that upside. I think, I think they have the end in mind with McKissick potentially leaving next year with his last year on the contract. Patterson, if he really shines, could be that role next year. Um, I guess what else? Would I talk? So Samus Reyes, um, mm -hmm. I think they're going to be creative with them. I think they're going to be or they're going to be like a mysterious injury come week four of the pre or sorry, week three of the preseason games and have a calf strain or a scroll, you know, a groin tweak or something like that. I think they're going to be creative and basically get him onto the um, practice squad over there. And I think uh, they'll get him on, but um, I like the upside with him. Um, I think Ricky Seals Jones, um, I want to see him again. I was really excited when we got him on our team, but I'd like looking back at his stats, he wasn't super dynamic. I think he had like maybe 16 to 20 catches in Arizona, I think it was his last stop. And like, yeah. you can kind of find those guys around and, you know, Reyes is a big guy. He proved that he could be a gamer with blocking. So, you know, I like, I'd rather aim for upside and aim for a high floor. So um, get Reyes, Reyes on the roster if you could. All right, fellas, let's switch real quick to defense and then we'll get to the one things that you're looking for. Uh, everybody loves to hate on John Bostic, but he's super smart and you can tell that the staff loves him a whole deal playing middle linebacker is one of the hardest things for a young player to do it didn't didn't used to be that way right i mean it used to be because you were a heat-seeking missile chasing after a running back as the middle linebacker the game has changed that is not the, that is not in the job description anymore i mean literally your job is to chase down people over the middle of the field so it, it's not totally surprising that boston played so many snaps the only thing I was surprised with, and I have a theory on that, I guess, is that he doesn't need those reps. So the only reason I can assume that he got that many reps, because he got a ton of reps in that first game, was kind of like when they said it was hard to understand Turner's offense with quarterback that couldn't throw the ball right. So maybe Bostic in there gave them a good opportunity to look at how well the rest of the players were figuring that if Davis was in there, they wouldn't get to see the real flow of the defense. Thoughts? Let's start with you, George. That's a good theory. That's actually really interesting, and I'll keep an eye on for it. Like, one of my theories going into last game and watching Davis, the experiment at the Mike linebacker, was to kind of, like, fill his cup and basically, like, you know, I, th I think they eventually want Jamin Davis to be the starting Mike, but I, just, I think this training camp is all about tinkering and playing, as we, as we alluded to before, right? I think they're throwing him in the deep end and giving him those play calling abilities, knowing that John Bostic could basically come in and become the Mike later on if Davis falters. Um, you know, I talked to Logan Paulson the other day. Luckily, I was really blessed to talk to him. But basically, we were just talking about how um, with Jamin Davis, his body is moving like, sorry, his mind, his body is moving faster than his mind, right? He's basically it's right. taking too long to kind of process the defense. And I think eventually they're going to kick him out to Will so he can just re read and react and kind of listen to what Bostic is going to say. So I do see that theory. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I think they want Davis at that mic position, but last preseason game, they might have put John Bostic there to one, as you mentioned, um, Doug, to see how the defense works collectively, but two, 
teachable moments for um, Davis, right? So when they're in that, in that linebacker room, sitting down watching the projector, you know, look at how John drops back on that pass play. Look how he reacts on this. Like, you can kind of, that's a teachable moment to show a 22 year old, 21 year old linebacker how to play. It's a, it has dual facets to it. It has both angles to it, which is a good thing. So I don't think it's bad. I think it's nice to give him exposure. So I actually, so I have a series of questions. I just started, I started doing this maybe like last week or two weeks ago, where I just, I asked a list of four questions um, heading into a game and then uh, post game as well. I asked a series of four questions and more so thought is, is, is intentions is to kind of promote and provoke some, some thoughts, uh, thoughtful responses. And George, you actually answered one and it was actually about John Bosick. I remember about that. <laughs> when do you think the lease will shorten? Yeah. And, and I think I actually read it. Yeah. Today's Friday. I read it yesterday on, on the stream and cause it was one of the better answers is that you don't think it will. Uh, just, just to sum it up, you don't think the lease will shorten with John Bosick and you gave your reasons. And then while I agree with you and I agree with what you're saying right now, I will also ask this question. Who the hell is behind the starting linebackers to begin with? Khalid Hudson is a, is a, is a famous name right now in training camp, but he hasn't shown anything yet. And it's only been one preseason game, so we have to let things unfold. That's that's I'll preface this statement by saying that. But he hasn't shown anything yet that determines he has played well enough to to even show that he's a quality backup. Like that's the important thing with these guys. So when you're starting top heavy, when you have a top heavy position, you can't afford injuries, but also you have to make sure that this group is in sync. Um, so Bosick playing where he was, who he was just frankly not good at all which is kind of crazy that you're not you're you're that bad in a preseason game it, at, at your your veteran status it's kind of crazy but he wasn't good uh, but at the same time sure when he gets out whoever's going to be behind him is going to have plenty of time to begin with because it's not that many it's 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 matter of fact who who the hell is his backup it's um it's I'm struggling sure that, that I'm not even familiar it's, with it's incredible Jamal because the the defensive coordinator and the head coach both linebackers and they Basically, I tell you, they don't care about the position. I mean, yes, they drafted one in the first round, but hey. you're right. You, you you don't know. It's witness protection for the backups <laughs> at the linebacker position because I don't know who they are either. I wrote them down. Yeah, guy Jay never heard of from the Panthers. It's Jared Norris and David Mayo. I wrote it down the other day. Yeah. So I'm like, Real, I don't even, Mayo, that's the guy I was thinking of. of. Mayo's from New York and Jared Norris was a uh, San Francisco 49er. Like, I guess Martin Mayhew must have brought him over from uh, – his time over there, but I, mean, I don't know anything about him to be honest with you. And you're yeah, right, and, and that's just the, the reality of the situation. Uh, Go ahead, Jamal. I was just, I was just going, to, yeah, I'll just, I'll just finish up real quick. That's kind of reality of the situation, man. Like we don't know the backups, and it's okay for us. Like we're not going to sit here and do some deep depth analysis on some backups that that we aren't familiar with. This it will be a pointless, it will be a pointless exercise. And I think that the facts of the matter is, if there was somebody who was better than John Bosco on the roster, uh, obviously opportunities matter, and getting your opportunity is one thing. That's a separate conversation from the one that we're having. Uh, but at the same time, if there was somebody that was clearly better than John Bosco, or at least challenging him for the starting role, you would have heard it in training camp you would have heard it over the summer who had potential but then you would also see it in the preseason games so again we're heading into the second game today as we speak but that's just something you would have to visibly see and you would have to hear from the coaches and there has been nobody that that challenged john boston to this point uh and, and truth be told uh i don't think that list is shortening no time soon and jamal we talked about this before i mean really they're going to run two linebackers 70% of the time anyway. I don't think that three are going to be on the field a whole lot. So maybe that's one of the reasons that they're not overly concerned about it. Uh, fellas, I asked both of you before uh, we started this to come up with two things. Uh, this is a thing I'm starting before each game, my two cents. So we'll pick one offense, one defense, and uh, tell me the things you're going to be looking for. George, let's start with you. All right, so I should do both, offense and defense, Doug? Yep. All right, cool. So number one, offense. Um, I know maybe this is kind of a cop out, but Ryan Fitzpatrick, man, I think a whole our whole season is going to be dependent on him. I do want to see him take command of the huddle. I want to see him call the plays efficiently. And I do want to see him like processing pretty quickly. Um, there was some conversations about, you know, this offseason about how even though he's a 17 year veteran, like the verbiage and Scott Turner's like philosophy, his ideas and like his concepts and why he calls these plays 
is basically different from what Fitzpatrick is used to. So I do want to see him run an effective offense. And my favorite thing, you guys saw it, Brian Baldinger really broke down the plays and throwing with anticipation. That's next level stuff. And basically with Brian Fitzpatrick being out there, I want him to like, I want him to instill that in our young wide receivers and running backs. Like, hey guys, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I expect you guys to do. I think it's going to be that next level education for them. And just to kind of add that a little bit more, I do want to see Diami Brown more. I think, you know, I want to see him build a chemistry. He was, I was like rooting for him to be drafted by Washington. So I'm like, I'm really high on him. So I'm really happy that he got him. If he actually, if Ryan Fitzpatrick is a like, top 15 quarterback, top 20 quarterback, and Diami Brown is legit, like let's say Samuel misses a couple of games, but we don't miss the beat with Brown in there. We, we're well on our way to a pretty good offense this year. And I'm pretty excited about that. So Fitzpatrick is my big thing there. Defense. Um, kind of what Jamal was talking about, chemistry and depth. I think um, our defensive backs, people are really, we're kind of top heavy there. I'm kind of curious where we're going to go with it. Um, we have Benjamin St. Juice, we have Fuller, we have um, William Jackson. I think they'll all be okay. Um, one interesting thing I saw um, listening to Sam Forte the other day, um, I didn't know this, I don't know if you guys did, but Ron Rivera intentionally got William Jackson and he intentionally drafted ben, Benjamin St. Juice because he knew they thrive in man coverage, which he wanted to transition more and kind of evolve more into this year. And, you know, that, those are their strengths. But I didn't know Ron Rivera intentionally. That's what his intention was with building the defense. And it makes a lot of sense. I think it's like with our pass rush, you know, if you can disrupt the wide receivers and let the dogs loose and get the um, quarterback there. Um, another interesting thing was, um, speaking of position flex, what came up was, hey, you know, we're, we're talking about ben, BSJ basically being a boundary cornerback, which is definitely interesting. I love to see that. But there's also talk about, like, just having the defensive backs being best available con considering the matchup, right? So let's say, like, hey, if we're playing the Chiefs, we have Tyreek Hill and some quick, you know, shift to your wide receivers. Maybe, maybe BSJ doesn't play that much on these reps. Maybe it'll be, you know, Fuller on the outside and Moreland at the slot or something like that. So – I definitely want to see the, the defensive back dynamic and kind of see how they're used. Um, two of my most intriguing rookies for me are BSJ and Diamond Brown. I really want to see them shine today. So that's what I'm looking for. It's interesting, George, when we had uh, Sam Monson on from PFF on Wednesday, and he was telling us a bit about Fitzpatrick. And it was like, it was, it was the oddest way that he put it. It was kind of like the old Adam Sandler bit, but he was like, Fitzpatrick's greatest thing is he knows he's not got a very good arm. And he knows he's not very mobile, and he, you know, but he, dad. <laughs> yeah, but he took all that. He took all that and said, "All right, I got that," and has kind of reformed his game around what it is that he does well. It's that Harvard brain of his. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think it's interesting that he said he went back and watched Philip Rivers' tape to get used to this offense instead of recent uh, Panthers' tape. I didn't know that. It's interesting. And why? It, why do that? I didn't hear that. Uh, I think because because the quarterback, I mean, Philip Rivers is Old. next level quarterback play. Okay. And, and, and basically you were looking at, I mean, I'm not trying to disparage Cam, but first of all, he wasn't healthy for those Scott Turner years and they really weren't running the same offense that they were True. running out. And, and, and as far as you St. Juice, I don't know who was on with you, Jamal, about a month ago and said that St. Juice be playing on the boundary sooner than later, but Pretty sure he was a handsome man with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Big Doug. Hey, yeah. Hey, look. A, a hey, lot Jamal, of Jamal, you got you got two things for. Us. Yeah, I do. Um, and and so this one the cornerback situation right now. I, I think I'll stick there for for the defense and then transition to offense. Uh, defensively, I was looking at William Jackson. Um, there's been some chatter. Uh whether it's reporters, whether it's coaches and William Jackson himself, uh, he's, he's not having a hard time adjusting. Like it's not, it's not extremely difficult for him to adjust, but he's facing some challenges. He's facing some setbacks. Um, just understanding what this defense wants to do for him, or excuse me, what coaches want him to do in this defense, him adjusting from uh, playing primarily one type of coverage, mostly in Cincinnati to playing a whole uh, a different type of coverage here in, in Washington. And, and that's kind of been setting them back for 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 a second. I um, mean, coaches notice it. Uh, he's he's aware of it uh, himself, the player. And then the media has been understanding that he's been struggling to to kind of adjust. And I don't think it's a bad thing in preseason. Uh, when I asked about a, a comfort level yesterday, I asked like, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, not comfort, but uh, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Level mm-hmm. of concern, excuse me, level okay. of concern. And, and and from the zero to ten, in the turn when when it comes to the player, it's 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 at a three for me. Um, when it comes to the coaches, I have more faith in the coaches to get him right in the regular season to put him in positions to win. However, I do think cornerback is a mental that is a mental position. Like you have to be on it. Um, j- just like the quarterback position and just like the kicker position, like you're these type of people, these type of players, they're on an island essentially for 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 a good portion of of their their games. And so I just need to see William Jackson. You don't have to go out there and make 17 tackles, uh, 30 pass deflections, and four picks. Like I just need you to see have a comfortable game. Uh, and then when the, when the film is out there, uh, and people are ready to play it back and have more time to look at it, I want to see that William Jackson actually played a really good game uh, for the time that he's out there uh, if he is playing. So that's kind of where I'm at on the defensive side. That's the one thing. Offensively, is John Bates. Uh, we talked about him for a second. We said that he was locking up the n- number two tight end spot. But here's the thing where, where I feel like he's in the middle of the situation. You have one person who is the, the unquestioned pass catcher in Logan Thomas. And then you have a person who's been stamped now, stamp of approval by the head coach and by people who watch the game as the most physical tight end. And that's Samus Reyes. Uh, John Bates is in the middle of that. We know John Bates is, he came into the league as a, as a run blocker, right? Uh, or a perceived run blocker. Like that would be his strength. But we haven't seen anything in that regards. I will give him credit as a pass catcher. There was something like in his one catch by itself, uh, down the seam, he made a great adjustment to the catch while also having uh, a great amount of focus on the ball itself because he was taking on contact as soon as he caught the ball. And that was really impressive to see from a guy who really saw saw his first look late in the game, that late in the game. So it was good to see. But I'm, I'm paying attention to John Bates to see how he's going to respond, given that there's two tight ends out to Mark Henry Ray and Samus Reyes, both out with concussions. You'll obviously see Logan Thomas to what extent we don't know. But you expect John Bates to have some time, and that's kind of where I'm at with this position. Uh, I need to see John Bates uh, in the time that he has, whether it's still 25 plays or or maybe even more than 25 plays. I just need to make sure that he's maximizing the opportunities that he get uh, and, and and show the coaches and show the fans that uh, he's actually more reliable than um, tight end twos of last year, which was who? Um, who the hell was that? I don't even know. I hope uh, it wasn't uh, – Sprinkle, oh, right? It wasn't um, God of Arkansas, right? Oh, Jeremy, Lord. Yeah. Jeremy Sprinkle, Please, Lord, yeah. help us. You know, it's interesting about help Bates us. when uh, Washington drafted Bates. I remember Kuiper said uh, Bates had the best tight ends not named – or the best hands of anybody not named Pitts or whatever that's worth, which I which I thought was interesting because I thought he was a blocking tight end too, but, but, but de- definitely had better hands than what he was given credit for. Go ahead, George. It's not going to touch on William Jackson. So great points, Jamal. Um, one thing that I saw, like, just kind of going around, like, concern for William Jackson. I'm with you, man. I don't think he – I'm not – my flag isn't waved for him yet. I think he's going to be okay. Um, I, I forget. I think um, Fred Smoot said it a long time ago with John Kime. It's easier to have a transferable skill if you're a man corner coming into a, a new system as opposed to a zone cover uh, corner. I know people were like, oh, you know, are we having a new Josh Norman here? Like, we're doing a, you know, big price free agent coming over and is it a struggle over here? But it's not like that. Like, Josh Norman was primarily as a cover three, cover two zone corner, came in at DC, was asked to be that shadow corner. And that wasn't his strength. But I think, and because he wasn't a fast guy, but um, William Jackson primarily is a man corner. And I think that's transferable skills. And if you can ball and you can basically sit on somebody's hip, you can do that no matter what. And I think um, you can learn that zone and that, like, that mental game for his own is eventually going to come with it. So I just think William Jackson is, um, it's just, you know, everyone's got to be patient. We only had one game of exposure. We're not, we're not there at camp all the time. So we'll see how Jackson grows. Fred, Fred, Fred Smoot said, if I was playing behind that defensive line, I would just line up five yards off the ball and dare receivers to do something. There you go. So I know they want to play a ton Smart. more man this year because they just weren't able to do it last year. <laughs> Let's, I can't believe we're almost It's, it's the easiest thing here. to do. That's right. No doubt, Jamal. No doubt. So let, let's wrap with this and let y'all get out of here. We I've asked everybody that's come on before the season starts. Uh, and Jamal, we'll start with you. What makes for a good season for Washington this year? What, what, what will make you feel good when the season's over? Doug, I just want you to know that's a simple yet excellent question to ask, especially at this point in the year. Um, what will make a good season for Washington? I think the most important thing that 
we need to understand with this season in general. And I actually, now that I think about it, I actually said this for 2016 too, um, because obviously 2016 is the year uh, where they're coming off the division title from 2015 and, and you're asking for expectations. Uh, obviously you expect teams to elevate after they make a playoff year and you, you want them to go a little bit further. Um, and I expect, um, I always say anywhere between eight to 10 wins. Um, and I still stick with that. And, and, and what I think a good season would be, I don't, I'm not sitting here. I'm not going to say anything less than a playoff berth is, is, is a failure. It, it all depends on how things unfold. You have to take into account that the division is getting better. Um, a lot of people are going to say the NFC East sucks. If you're looking on the outside and truth be told, everybody got better. Uh, I, I don't know about Philly, but you know, maybe that's, that's <laughs> another that's another story. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not Philly, but that does obviously Washington is not alone. Um, you're also going up against teams who have you have about. We're not going. We're not going schedule wise here. We're not going rec- game by game, but you have at least eight quarterbacks in eight teams with top tier offenses, and you have to you have to take that into account. Like you're you're going to have to rely a lot on your offense. Like how are they going to be playing games? Are they going to be more disciplined? Are they going to be able to put up points? Are they going to have some games where they upset teams? Are they, are they going to have some teams or some games where? Uh, excuse me. Are they going to be able to be com- competitive throughout each each of the games? Uh, or they're going to have some teams in, in some weeks where they let where they let where there's a letdown of sorts. Um, it, all all these things factor into account. And I think if you have these games where you're competitive weekly or you have that one letdown out of 17 games or that two letdowns out of 17 games, if, if those two contributes to the fact that you miss out on the playoffs, then then maybe I say this. This, this is a failure. But if you're competitive throughout and, and these these losses are within a, a possession or a, few, uh, a possession, maybe two scores at most, um, then, you know, we'll see. But uh, I, I think it all comes down to competitiveness and also how you respond against the better teams because you will be facing top-tier offenses uh, compared to last year where the defense got a break on multiple occasions facing backups amongst the offensive line and backups at the quarterback position. So it, it really all depends to, to competitiveness and, and how they react against the better teams. Am I up? So Jamal yeah. definitely, <laughs> Jamal brought some levity conversation. It was very mature and kind of convinced me a little bit right there. Because <laughs> basically, I was going heavy. I was like, you know what? I think it's definitely a uh, – I was like, you know, a playoff berth. You know, one victory in the playoffs is kind of my, what I was eyeing. But I really like what he said. and really kind of took, made me take a step back as well. Um, I think a letdown would be if we were like sub-500. I think we have high hopes going into this year, and I think that would kind of hurt our fan base and hurt – you know, I think we'd be really disappointed with that. But I think, um, as Jamal alluded to, it, it is the eye test, right? We're all pretty savvy fans. We all have our, you know, we've studied this all the time and we're into it. If we look good, if we're competitive, we're standing toe-to-toe with the Chiefs. And if we are, you know, com- like we are one of the top two in our division throughout the year, I think people understand that we're a young team and that we do have future potential. And I think people, like, you know, there's a lot of talk of we're a quarterback away from really taking that next step. And that would be an ideal goal by the end of the year. If we're like, nine, 10 win team. And, you know, we're basically, you know, we messed up a couple of times, but, you know, Fitzpatrick had a couple of Fitz tragic games and like, Hey, we're not there yet. If we look pretty good and we look promising moving forward, I think that's basically should be our goal for the year. Um, personally, I would be disappointed if we don't make the playoffs, but you know, things happen, but um, I'd really do like, like what Jamal said. Maybe we should kind of just take a macro perspective. We have a tough schedule. We do play some tough quarterbacks. Maybe we shouldn't be so bullish. And I do think, you know, the Cowboys, I mean, I don't know. I mean, whatever. It's because it's controversial in, in the Washington network, but the Cowboys are a good team and they have a good offense. Um, their defense is still suspect. Uh, I do think the Giants have a good defense, but their coaches I have no idea what the hell's going on over there. And uh, you know, we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, the NFC East is going to be competitive. It's not going to be a well, it's not going to be a seven and nine winner. I'll tell you that this year. So, give me something to keep an eye on. Now, I right. do think that there's a win threshold. I, I do think that. I, to, just okay. to be clear, so if we're talking about uh, uh, Washington come finishing the year with, uh, again, like I said, eight to ten wins is okay. But if we're talking about Washington finishing the, it, for my perspective, finishing the season with seven or less, um, then then yes, you have to start asking like, was this season a failure? Because my expectations are already set somewhere between eight to ten. Obviously, we have to see how they all unfolds and take everything into account. But I do think that. I do think it's possible and fair to include a win threshold uh, and seeing if, if they meet that before 
Um, we're like, all right, well, they didn't make the playoffs, but they got eight wins, and the way they the way they lost their games, you know, X Y X Y Z, all that stuff coming into account. That's that's one thing. But I do think there's a win threshold. So um, start talking to me again if, if they if they finish the season seven and ten or six and eleven <laughs> or some shit like that. So uh, yeah. then we have something to talk about. <laughs> Jamal, tell the people where they can find you and what you got coming up next. All right. Um, first and foremost, though, Doug, uh, I appreciate this, man. Like you said before we started, we've been trying to do this for a minute. Um, and we finally got this going. So I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad to be on and I appreciate the conversation. George, I appreciate you as well. Uh for all of us just chopping it up and talking to Washington football. Uh you can find me uh all my socials is let Maul tell it. Um Mall with a U, uh, M U A L, because some people may not know that. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> let Mall tell it. Uh, and uh, you can find me on Hogs Haven for my written work. Uh, you can find me on the Hog Style for my written work there as well. Um, and, and we have a podcast on that side too. And obviously, uh, Trapper Dive Podcast is my own. Um, I, I do that a few times out of the week. Um, so yeah, that's that's all my information. You'll find everything pretty much on my Twitter too. So uh, you can follow me there, and and we can connect through that way. And the Twitch too, right? You started doing the Twitch, which is big as cool. I'm think about something like that myself. Yeah, yeah. The Twitch is pretty cool, man. It's live stream and aspect of the podcast. The the podcast is always live streamed. Um, there's no there's no uh recording only. Uh, unless there was an emergency or something, but I haven't ran into that yet. But yeah, everything's live stream. You can tap in, uh, join the join the comment section, or even uh, we're starting to implement call-ins. We have to, first and foremost, we have to get our first caller. <laughs> but um, yeah, call-ins too. So you can always be a part of the show, whether it's uh, joining the conversation through the chat or joining the conversation through calling in. So uh, yes, the live stream aspect is on Twitch and we stream every single podcast um podcast recording and stuff like that so you can check us out all right george tell us about yourself what's up guys yeah thank you doug again for having me on here i love you know i love all your content love keeping in touch with you over twitter as well and thank you jamal for your insight as well i think uh my favorite part about these podcasts are interacting with you guys and hearing different perspectives and i think all of us even i don't get too deep but as a society can learn from each other we actually sit back and listen so thank you guys for giving me you guys your insight on everything so um absolutely I'll, all my socials are at gcarmy21. You guys can find me at Twitter. Um, I've been writing on full press coverage for a long time, for a couple of years now. Uh, you can still find my work. I usually promote it on my Twitter handle. Um, I'm humbly stepping, oh, I, sorry. I also write for the Burgundy Zone as well. I work with Kyle and Mike and Mike. There's definitely some cool guys over there. And I'm humbly stepping into the podcast game. We had our first trial um, yesterday. It worked out pretty well. And I'm learning from you guys. And I'd love to have you guys on in the future if you guys are up for it. And we'll talk about it going, moving forward now. I think we're going to have a reflection pod after the preseason game pretty soon. So I'll let you guys know what's up. Absolutely. Well, as I got to tell you, this was one of my favorites. It was a whole lot of fun. So I really appreciate you. And we'll do it again sometime. Sounds good, Doug. Absolutely, Doug. Appreciate you, big dog. <laughs> All right, fellas. All right, y'all. See you later.